I'm simply gonna encourage you to go back and watch that video, okay? It's gonna be crucial for you. If you missed yesterday's presentation, it's gonna be crucial for you to see yesterday's presentation so that tonight's presentation, tonight's presentation will make sense, but it will make even more sense uh, if you see last night's video. So please watch that video if you missed it. I'm just gonna do a little recap. We're gonna go back maybe two slides uh, from the last, uh, our last, uh, present, last slide yesterday. I'm gonna go back about two slides and then we're going to begin moving forward in fresh new material, okay? So here is where we're gonna start. I want you to notice on the screen um, that the children of Israel uh, have committed two mistakes in the Old Testament, okay? Number one, after they get into the Promised Land, they have uh, rejected their priest for a king. So you'll remember the children of Israel uh, asked for a king, they rejected Saul uh, or Samuel and asked for a king, God gave them King Saul. Now God permitted this, God never wanted them to have a king, but he permitted this because of their own desires. And that desire led to some very, very um, uh, unfortunate things in the history of Israel, okay? So that's number one. Number one, they rejected their priest for a king. And number two, you'll remember we discussed that David builds God, or rather David um, assumes that God wants him to build him a house. He passes it, off to, passes it off to his son Solomon. But if you read carefully, and I actually got a question about this yesterday. If you read carefully in 1 Chronicles 22 and 28, David says, you know, God told me that I couldn't build a house because my hands were bloody and also because uh, my, my son was going to build it, Solomon. If you read the actual account in 1 Kings chapter 17, what God actually said uh, to the prophet Nathan those words were not included. God never told David, um, it's because your hands were bloodied, uh, or it, God just said, when have I ever asked anyone to build me a house? Why would you build me a house of great you know, splendor and magnificence? I, I'm, I'm not asking for that. God says, I'm gonna build you a house and I'm going to raise up a seed from you that is going to be the one that builds that house. He's talking about the Messiah but David assumes that he's talking about his son Solomon. So listen carefully, God permits Solomon to build this temple, okay? But it was not his, God didn't come to them and say, hey, you guys need to build me a sanctuary like he did in the book of Exodus, okay? All right, so, so far we've got that, the two mistakes that are made. Number one, they rejected their priest for a king, and number two, they began to put emphasis on outward adornment, on the outward nature of the building, despite God saying, don't build me a house. You know, that's not what I, that's not my desire. All right. So with that in mind, we now begin to see that these two mistakes began to lead the children of Israel down a road where they begin to break every principle of the sanctuary itself. Remember, we talked about the altar of sacrifice. They began to sacrifice to other gods. They began to burn incense to other gods. They rejected the word of God. They rejected the light of God. They rejected the law of God. In other words, every article of furniture that we find in the sanctuary, the altar of sacrifice, the laver, the altar of incense, the table of showbread, the seven branch candlestick, and the Ark of the Covenant, they broke every principle represented by those articles of furniture. And as a result, they end up in Babylonian captivity. This is where we pick up on tonight. The children of Israel are in Babylonian captivity and we are now introduced to the book of Daniel and to the prophet Daniel. And I want you to notice it is here in the book of Daniel that we now find these words. It is a prophecy given in Daniel chapter nine. And I'm gonna read the prophecy first and then we're gonna go back and expound on this prophecy a bit. So the Bible says here, Daniel 9, verse 24, 70 weeks, that would be 70 times seven days, 70 times seven. Now, 
you will remember from yesterday's presentation, and again, if you haven't seen it, you need to go back and watch it. You'll remember what the number 70 times seven represents. 70 times seven represents a period of mercy or grace extended to those who are in need, those who are in rebellion, right? Remember Jesus said that we should forgive our enemies? How often? 70 times seven. So when we see this number here, 70 weeks or 70 times seven, we can automatically know that this represents a period of mercy being granted to the children of Israel. Why? Remember, they have broken everything the sanctuary stands for and Babylon has come burnt down their sanctuary and taken them captive. Again, this is where we're introduced to the story of Daniel. Now, as I told you yesterday, we're going to be moving through this presentation like a movie format. So you should remember the movie that we saw yesterday. This is part two of that movie. The children of Israel are in captivity and God gives them this prophecy through the prophet Daniel. And here's what it says. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. In essence, what God is saying here is very simple. Daniel, tell Israel that they have 70 weeks of mercy granted to them. If they don't get themselves together at the end of this 70 week period, they are going to be cut off from my grace. Now guys, hold on a second because you're like, wait a minute, Israel will never be cut off from God's grace. Just hold your thought here. I just want you to see the prophecy states 70 weeks are determined. That word determined means cut off. 70 weeks are determined or cut off for your people to get it together. Now hold on for a second. What did Lucifer, what do you think Lucifer thought in heaven? Remember when God extended to him a 70 times seven? Hey, listen. Uh, God is saying to Lucifer, I'm going to be merciful to you. I'm going to give you an opportunity to repent. Do you think Lucifer might have thought in his head, well, look, I'm the covering cherub. God is never going to do anything to me. Like, I'm good to go. It doesn't matter what I do. I can rebel against God. I can say I hate God. I can just do anything I want, and God will never kick me out of heaven. Do you think Lucifer might have thought that? Yeah, 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 he probably did. Do you think Lucifer would have been deceived for thinking that? Yeah, God's not going to do anything. Okay, so here we have this prophecy, 70 weeks are determined upon you, Israel, to get it together. Now, I want you to notice this. It goes on to say, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. Now, I don't want you to focus so much on the time period here. I simply want you to understand this. The Bible gives a starting point for this 70 week prophecy from the going forth of the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Remember, Jerusalem had been burnt down. God says, Counting from this time when a commandment goes forth to rebuild Jerusalem, if you count 70 weeks from that point, something is going to happen. And the text tells us what's going to happen. It says the Messiah, the Prince shall come. So this prophecy is basically stating, listen, within this 70 week period, the Messiah is going to come. If you accept him, amen. If you reject him, it's not going to be good for you. So, I want you to notice that according to Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 6, the Bible says, I have appointed thee each day for a year. I'm going to break down a very simple principle to you. In Bible prophecy, whenever you're dealing with prophecy, a day stands for a year. So, this 70 weeks or 70 times 7 would equal 490 days. Now, how do we know that this is true? Because listen, the decree to rebuild Jerusalem went forth in 457 BC by King Artaxerxes of the Medo-Persian Empire. Now, if you count 490 days from 457 BC, you don't get two years. 
All right, do you catch what I'm saying? If it's, if it's a day for a day, you don't even get two years. Jesus comes hundreds of years after this. But if you apply the day for year principle, guess what? That takes you right down to the very time of Jesus. So let's see this. I want you to check this out. When this decree goes forward in 457 BC, Medo-Persia has for some years now already overthrown Babylon and allowed the Jews to go back to Jerusalem to begin the work of rebuilding their city and their temple. The decree for, that was given was in 457 BC, and if you count 490 years, it takes you through the empire of Greece all the way down to the empire of Rome. And it is the empire of Rome in which Jesus the Messiah appears on the scene. All right, are you following so far? The, the Jews have just been told that in 490 years, roughly, the Messiah will appear. If you accept him, you will be good. If you reject him, it will not be good for you. All right. Let's see what happens. 490 years takes us right into the New Testament. Now, guys, I want to show you something. I just want to pause right here for a second. I just want to let you know that between yesterday's message and where we are right now, we have just covered the entire history of the Old Testament. And beyond that, we started from way, 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 way back in heaven before the earth was created, and we have gone all the way down. We are now in the book of Matthew. If you thought that it would take years and years to go through the entire Bible, or months and months, or weeks and weeks, for you to have a, a good grasp of the entire Old Testament alone, I'm just, I've just showed you, you have just seen in movie format, the entire history from eternity past, the rebellion in heaven, all the way to the New Testament. How do you feel? Watch that movie again yesterday. Watch the first few minutes that we did today. And you now have the whole history of the Old Testament down. Because the whole history of the Old Testament, beloved, is God giving Israel the sanctuary and Satan trying to stop Israel from actually fulfilling their purpose through the sanctuary. So, we come to the New Testament, and I want you to check this out, because even the New Testament is based upon the sanctuary principle. Watch this. <clears throat> the first four books of the New Testament are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And I want you to check this out, because on the screen, you're going to see that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all deal with the sacrifice of Christ, which points us to the altar of sacrifice. The next book is the book of Acts, which was all about baptism. Lo and behold, the book of Acts corresponds with the laver, which was a symbol of baptism. Then you have the epistles from Romans all the way to Jude. These books cover the importance of the word of God, the table of showbread, the importance of Christ's intercession, the altar of incense, and the importance of Christian witnessing. Let your light shine that men may see your good works. That's the candlestick. After the book of Jude, we enter into the book of Revelation, which takes us right into the throne room of God, which corresponds with the most holy place and the Ark of the Covenant. In other words, beloved, not only is the entire Old Testament that we just saw based on the sanctuary model, but the entire New Testament is based on that model as well. If you understand the sanctuary, you understand you have everything you need to understand the entire Bible. And if I stop the presentation here, you're already on a good path, guys. If you just take what you learned yesterday and what you learned in these first few minutes, you have already gained an understanding of the entire basis of the whole Bible. The whole Bible. Understand these six articles of furniture and you have everything you need to understand the Bible. But we're going to keep going because there is a whole lot more. I want you to watch carefully. Because the sanctuary also reveals the mission of Christ from heaven to this earth. What do you mean, Pastor? Look carefully. If you look at article number six, the altar or the Ark of the Covenant representing the throne of God, we know that Christ 
descended from his throne in heaven to come down to earth. He left his throne, the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant. He came down to this earth as the manna, as the bread of life. He was the light that came into the world, the seven branch candlestick. He lived a life of prayer. That's the altar of incense. He was baptized at the age of 30. That's the labor. And then he was crucified at the age of 33. That's the altar of sacrifice. Beloved, I need you to catch that because the sanctuary reveals the history of Christ from heaven all the way to the cross. I hope you are getting excited. And there's more. Because, beloved, if you flip this diagram the other way and just take it from the birth of Christ, I want you to listen carefully. Christ was born in a manger among animals. Where were the animals taken in the sanctuary? They were taken to the altar of sacrifice. We might say it this way. Christ was born <clears throat> on the altar of sacrifice. He was born a living sacrifice. He came into this world for the sole purpose of dying for our sins. At the age of 30, he is baptized. That parallels with the labor. After his baptism, he goes up into the wilderness where he is tempted three times. The first temptation, turn this stone to bread. That's the table of showbread, guys. <laughs> the very next temptation, he's taken up to a high place and, he, and he's, he's told to throw himself down and call out to God. Pray to his father and his father will save him. Satan is trying to tempt Jesus at the altar of incense, which symbolizes the prayers of the saints. Prayer. The third temptation, the Bible says, uh, Satan takes him to this high mountain and shows him the glory of the world. Remember that text, a city set on a hill cannot be hid? Remember that we said the candlestick represents a ci the city of God, the people of God. A city on a hill cannot be hid. Jesus is taken to this mountaintop and the Bible says that Satan showed him all the glory of the worlds, of the cities and says, bow down to me and I will give you the people you came for. I will give you your seven branch candlestick. Jesus overcomes all three temptations and goes on to preach the law of God. If you love me, keep my commandments and the mercy of God. Repent that your sins may be blotted out. Beloved, the very gospel is found in the sanctuary. The sanctuary is not some Old Testament relic that was done away with in the Old Testament. Its very principles point to Jesus Christ himself and what he came to this earth to do on our behalf. But wait, there is more. So you'll remember that Jesus gives his first sermon on the Mount. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. And I want you to notice some things Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. It's his first sermon, guys. And notice what he says. First of all, one of the things he says is, blessed are they who mourn. Mourn for what? Mourn for their own sins. Mourn for, the, for what their sins have caused Jesus Christ. Mourn for righteousness sake. Now listen, beloved, what is the wages of sin? The wages of sin is death. There are those who are mourning for what their sins have caused. And beloved, when Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, listen, he's pointing to the altar of sacrifice. When he says in the same Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the pure, he's pointing to the labor which symbolize purity, the washing and regeneration through the Holy Spirit. So blessed are the pure points us to the labor purification. When Jesus said in that same Sermon on the Mount, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, he's talking about the table of showbread, guys, the word of God. When Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, those who are reconciling, he's talking about the altar of incense. In the same Sermon on the Mount, he says, you are the light of the world. Men do not light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. He's pointing us to the seven branch candlestick saying, let your light shine. In that same sermon, Jesus says, think not that I'm come to change the law. 
Thank God that I'm come to do away with it. He's pointing us, beloved, to the Ten Commandments and showing us that that law is an eternal law. And when he says, blessed are the merciful, he's pointing our attention to the mercy seat. I hope you catch this, guys. The Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is pointing us to the very fact that his way is in the sanctuary. But wait, there is more. Because ultimately, beloved, what I want you to understand is the sanctuary contains the very path to salvation. Pastor, what do you mean? Listen, it's just like a GPS. If you're lost, the best thing you can do is depend upon a GPS to find your way home. The sanctuary is God's GPS, his gospel path or plan of salvation. Don't leave home without it. Don't let anyone tell you, hey, all you need to do to get to heaven is this or that. Go trust the GPS. And here's what the GPS tells us, beloved. The GPS tells us that if we want to be saved, we must first accept the sacrifice of Christ. Accept it with our mouths. That is what points to the altar of sacrifice. But it does not stop there, guys. Don't let anyone tell you all you need to do is accept Christ with your mouth because the same Bible says that we must repent and be baptized. That's the labor. Listen, beloved, if you accept Christ with your mouth, Satan's going to try to convince you, all right, you're good to go. You don't need to go any further, but you know, wait a minute, I got the blueprint and the blueprint tells me that not only must I accept with my mouth, but I must be baptized. Amen. Yeah, I'll say amen for you. Amen. Not only that, beloved, but if we have truly given our lives to Christ at the altar of sacrifice, if we truly pick up our cross, if we truly uh, uh, um, uh, desire and experience that born again experience, then, beloved, what's going to happen is that we're going to move to the next step, which is we must eat the word of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Beloved, if we truly, if we have truly accepted the sacrifice of Christ, and if we've truly been born again, we will be found eating the word of God. We will be found praying and communing with God. That's the altar of incense. We will be found letting our light shine. And here's how I like to put it, guys. I want you to imagine this as a board game, okay? Your goal is to get to the Ark of the Covenant because that's where the presence of God is right? That's where we ultimately want to get to, the mercy seat of God. So if that's the case, Satan's trying to stop you at every step. I want you to think of these six articles as bases, right? You get to base one that, you know, base one is, is, is excellent. Praise God. But there are more bases. You can't just say, have accepted Christ's sacrifice, but I haven't been baptized and I don't study and I don't pray. I don't read his word and I don't share. No, that it doesn't work like that. But the devil wants you to believe that. So you'll have 10 demons trying to stop you from accepting the altar of sacrifice. If you break through that, he'll have 20 demons trying to tell you you don't need to be baptized. If you get baptized, he'll have 60 demons telling you that you don't need to study, you don't need to pray, and you surely don't need to be sharing Jesus with people in the workplace or your neighbors or your friends or your family. And beloved, listen to me. If he's got 60 demons trying to tell you you don't need to study, pray, or let your light shine, he's got a billion demons trying to tell you that you do not need to keep God's commandments. You can be good without obeying his law. Hmm. Does that sound familiar? Yes, it does. It should. If you remember yesterday's message, what did Lucifer, what was Lucifer's argument in heaven? Remember, I can be like God without obeying his law of love. Beloved, make no mistake about it. The law of God is the law of love. So, catch the picture, guys. The sanctuary reveals to us God's path of salvation. And that's why the devil doesn't want it out there because he knows that if people begin to understand this, it doesn't matter who you are. You could be an atheist. You could be someone of a, of, you could be a Buddhist, a, 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 a Hindu. You could be, you could be whatever. God knows, Satan knows that if you understand this and see this and see the beauty of this, hmm, he will lose a soul from his kingdom. So he doesn't want us to understand this. So watch this. Jesus comes and he reveals all these things through symbols, through his life, and then he goes to the cross. 
Why? The Jews have rejected. Remember the prophecy? You have 70 weeks. My son is coming. If you reject him, I'm going to take the gospel from you and give it to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. What do they do? They put Christ on the cross. And check this out, guys. When Christ is on the cross, I want you to see this. Was he nailed in his feet? Yes. Did he, was his side pierced from which blood and water came out? Yes. Was he nailed in his right hand and his left hand? Yes. Did he die from a broken heart? Yes. Did he have a crown of thorns on his head? Yes. In other words, beloved, every article of furniture prophesied the exact spot that Jesus would be wounded for us. Hands, altar, of, table of showbread, seven branch candlestick. He died of a broken heart because the communication between he and his father were cut off. His side was pierced just like the laver had water and blood mingled because the priests, when they would wash their hands, they had blood on it. So Jesus' side, when it was pierced, water and blood came out. He was nailed in his feet and had a crown of thorns. Beloved, the sanctuary prophesied that Jesus Christ would come and die on a cross for our sins. There is more. You see, beloved, I want you to listen carefully. At the cross, the, 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 the sanctuary tells us, the sanctuary reveals to us who Christ was at the cross. Because listen, at the cross, he was the Lamb of God that was slain for our sins. That's the altar of sacrifice. He was the fountain of life when his side was opened up. That's the labor. He was the bread of life that was broken for us. That's the table of showbread. He was our intercessor when he prayed, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's the altar of incense. He was the light of the world when, at the tr when he was nailed to that tree because you'll see that the candlestick, beloved, is a tree of light. Jesus died on the tree. He was the light of the world and his death is the light of the world. What he did on that cross is the very light of the world because it reveals God's love for us. So at the cross, he was the light of the world. And finally, beloved, at the cross, Jesus sat on his throne. And let me break this down for you very quickly because you see, beloved, remember at the, at the Ark of the Covenant, you had the mercy seat, you had the presence of God, and then on either side was of the presence of God were two covering cherubim. Now remember, one of these cherubim was for him, one was against him. Can you see the picture of Jesus on the cross? <laughs> you guys, catch this. Jesus was on his mercy seat at the cross. You'd say, Pastor, what do you mean? Listen carefully. When they crucified Christ, it was not the nails that held them up. They actually put what was called a sedulum on the cross. It was a seat that the person could sit on and it actually made their suffering last longer. So they would get tired and sit down, but with their hands above their head, they would run out of breath. They'd have to stand up, catch their breath, cause them pain, and this simply prolonged the suffering. Simply to say, beloved, Jesus was sitting on the cross. <laughs> He was sitting down on the cross. It's as if he was sitting on his throne. And remember what they nailed over his head. The king of the Jews. What did he have on his head? A crown of thorns. Jesus was. <laughs> Beloved, Jesus was our mercy seat as he sat on the cross as God in the flesh. Flanked by two thieves one was for him and the other against him. Whew. You guys, I hope you're catching this. At the cross, beloved, Christ came in essence to donate blood for us. The cross is the divine blood drive. Why? Because the blood of Christ is the antivirus to sin. The blood of Christ is the serum to sin. It is what saves us from that virus of sin. And how does the blood of Christ do that, beloved? It's very simple. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty five, 25, in like manner also the cup after, uh, they took the cup after supper saying, Jesus took the cup after, after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Please, I want you to just stop there and think about this for a second. Jesus said the new covenant is in my blood. 
Let me say it this way. Jesus has special DNA in his blood. He has a one of a kind DNA. What is that DNA you ask? It is the divine nature attributes and it's found in his blood. So when he gives us his blood, he's giving us a divine nature to help us overcome what Satan has brought into the world. Beloved, the reason for this is that the covenant is the law of God written in the mind. That covenant is in his blood. He delighted to do the will of his father. And now he says, I'm going to give you that same blood that delights to do the will of my father. I'm going to give you my DNA, my divine nature attributes. How many of you want Jesus's divine nature attributes? Yes, beloved. He gives it to us as a promise. And you can have it if you simply ask for it. So we got to keep moving. I want you to notice this, all right? We're going to come back. I want you to follow the movie, guys. Jesus has come. The Jews as a nation have rejected him. And I want you to notice what happened. The Bible says Jesus, when he cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in two from the top to the bottom. What does that mean? Why was a veil in the temple rent? The veil in the temple was rent because Jesus told us just earlier, he said in Matthew 24, behold, your house is left unto you desolate. When they rejected Christ, when Christ died at the cross, the earthly sanctuary was, no, was of no more use. It was no longer valid. The veil in the temple rent in two. Now I'm going to need you to follow this carefully, guys. I'm going to need you to listen very carefully. Because if the earthly sanctuary was shut down, what is God doing now? What would he do now? Listen. In the book of Revelation, guess where John sees Jesus? This John is still alive, right? John is still alive in the book of Revelation, John the Revelator. So this is around 95 AD. Guess where John sees Jesus? Revelation 1 verse 12. John is in vision and he says, I turned to see the voice that spake with me and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the son of man. Pause for a second. Where does John see Jesus? He sees him. Come on, guys. He sees him where? In heaven. John is on earth, but he's having a vision of Jesus in heaven. And where does he see Jesus standing? In the midst of seven golden candlesticks. What does that tell us? It tells us that Jesus, our high priest, is in the sanctuary in heaven. The sanctuary in earth has shut down and the sanctuary in heaven is now operating on behalf of mankind. We now have a high priest who has entered into that heavenly sanctuary. But that is not it. There is more. Listen carefully. On a, in Acts chapter 2, verse 1, it says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. Now, I got a question for you. What does the Holy Spirit fill in these two verses? That mighty rushing wind, what does it fill? It fills two things, guys. I want you to notice this. The first thing it fills is the house where they were sitting. The presence of God fills the house where they were sitting. Now, why is this important? Whew. Listen, guys, this is amazing. Check this out. In the Old Testament, when God had instructed the children of Israel to make him a sanctuary, when they had finished building the sanctuary back there in the wilderness, this is the first sanctuary, right? The one that God said, build me a sanctuary. Not the one that David said, I'm going to make you a sanctuary. And God's like, no, what are you doing? And David's like, okay, I'm going to let my son do it. And God's like, all right, do it. No, no, no. This is the one that God said, I want you to build me a sanctuary. And when that sanctuary was finished, the Bible says in Exodus chapter 40, verse 33, Moses reared up the court round about the tabernacle and the altar and set up the hanging of the court gate. So Moses finished the work. Then a cloud 
covered the tent of the congregation and the glory of the Lord filled the what? The tabernacle. In the Old Testament, the presence of God, the place where God was going to instruct his people from, it filled the tabernacle. But after the death of Christ, where does the glory of God fall? Yes, you guys, it falls in a house. Let me say that again. It falls in a house. I need you to understand what's happening here because the Bible says in Acts 2 verse 46, and they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Listen, guys, do you want to know how the gospel spread in the early church? You want to know how the gospel spread? It spread from house to house. God was not operating through the big structure of the building as, remember, David, I'm going to build you a big structure. And God's like, no, that's not what I want. But David says, I'm going to build it. And he, he leads his son to build it. Solomon builds it. But it was this big, beautiful edifice. And they began to trust in outward adornment and outward appearances to the point that God allows Babylon to come and destroy their temple. They eventually rebuild it. But check this out. In the New Testament, God says, I'm doing a new thing and I'm going to manifest myself in the homes of individuals. <laughs> the gospel goes forth with great speed because it was going from house to house. Can somebody say coronavirus? <laughs> Can, can, can somebody just look at the situation we're in right now? Could it be? Now, I'm going to pause. I'm just, I'm just going to come back to that a little bit later, guys. I just want you to catch this point right now. The gospel spread most rapidly when it was going via internet. Oh, no, they didn't have internet in those days. When it was going via house fire in those days. That's where the word was getting out. That's where people in their homes were sitting down and hearing the truth and Satan could not do much to stop it. How do you go into people's homes and stop the internet? How do you go into people's homes and stop Bible studies from happening? How do you do that? So, what ends up happening, number one, check this out. One sanctuary in heaven. But God is doing a new thing in the homes of individuals where people are going from house to house giving Bible studies and sharing the truth. But listen, the Bible says it also filled the disciples. 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, Know you not that you are the temple of God, beloved, and the Spirit of God dwells in you. So watch this. There's a sanctuary in heaven. God says, I'm making the home my new sanctuary on earth, and you as a person become a human sanctuary for me. Why is that so crazy, guys? Because I want you to understand. The spreading of the New Testament gospel it's all about building sanctuaries. You are a temple. When you give your life to Christ, you are another temple that has been raised up for God, for the Spirit of God to dwell in. And check this out. You know what happens? God calls a man by the name of Paul to take the gospel to the Gentiles. You want to know what Paul's trade was? Paul was a tent maker by trade. Yeah, yeah, hmm. yeah, yeah. I hope you're catching this, guys. God uses a tent maker to go out and spread the gospel, which is the work of building tents for God. You become a temple. Every time someone gives their life to Christ, another temple has been, has been raised up. Another temple has been raised up. Another temple has been raised up. These are humble temples. 
Temples that are raising up from being raised up from house to house to house to house. So check this out, guys. I want you to see this and see this very carefully. What is Paul doing? He is going forth in the, with the New Testament gospel. Basically, God is saying, here's how I'm going to protect my temple. I'm going to give you the armor of God. Check it out on the screen, guys, because God says, I'm going to arm you up with the gospel shoes. Man, that seems to parallel with me with the altar of sacrifice because Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. You need gospel shoes to do that. You need gospel shoes to help you walk my path. That's the altar of sacrifice. He says, Lord, uh, gird about your loins with truth. That means being washed by the water and the spirit. That's the labor. He says, take up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. He says, put on the breastplate of righteousness, which parallels with the, uh, with the altar of, uh, of incense. He says, have your faith, the, the, the shield of faith, which is like gold tried in fire. Beloved, that's a seven branch candlestick. And then he says, put on the helmet of salvation, which beloved is the law of God written in your minds. If you love me, keep my commandment. Listen carefully, beloved. We are not saved because we keep the law. We are saved because of God's mercy. But if you want to be under the mercy seat, you have to be keeping that which is under it, which is the law of God. You got to get into the ark. I hope you caught that just now. If you want to find mercy, you have to be under God's mercy seat, which means you are keeping his commandments, the law of love. All right, we got to keep moving. So, so, so watch this, guys. What happens at the cross? The people of God, the Jews, Abraham's descendants, what do they do? They reject him at the cross. They reject his sacrifice, the altar of sacrifice. They reject his cleansing power, that's the labor. They reject his word, that's a table of showbread. They reject his prayer, Father forgive them, they know not what they do. They reject his prayer, they reject his light, they reject his law, they say we don't need your mercy and as a result of that beloved, the, the, the Jews are cut off. Now watch this beloved, please listen carefully to me. Because I, I don't, don't jump ahead and think, oh, he just said, listen carefully. Notice what Jesus said in Matthew 21, verse 43. He said to his own people, therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. That nation, beloved, listen carefully, is a nation of Jew and Gentile. You see, at the cross, there was a transition from literal Israel, Israel after the flesh, to spiritual Israel, Israel after the spirit. There was a transition from earthly temple to heavenly temple and human temple on earth. Listen to what the Bible says here. It says that there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus, and if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed, beloved. Let me tell you, the Satan, Satan has pulled off one of the most, one of the greatest lies. If you belong to Christ, you are Abraham's seed. There it is, right? You're reading it for yourself right there, guys. You are counted as Abraham's seed. That's why Acts chapter 17, verse 26 says that he is made of one blood, all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. Beloved, listen to me. That one blood is the blood of Jesus. If you're related to Jesus, you're Abraham's seed. If Jesus is in you, you're Abraham's seed. That means that you become Israel. Anyone who believes in Jesus is Israel. Jesus said, I can raise up Israel out of stones. Don't think that just because you came from the bloodline, that makes you special. You can reject the Messiah. You can do this and do that and whatever. And God is still going to just whatever because of who you... you guys, this is Bible. God is saying the plan of salvation is open to everyone. And by the way, I don't have stepchildren. <laughs> God doesn't have stepchildren. We're either his child or we are not. And what determines that? If we've accepted Jesus Christ. All right, come on, we got to keep moving. So, want you to know what happens, all right? Check this out, guys. 
at the end, this is the 70 week prophecy we've been talking about. The 70 weeks ends after the death of Jesus Christ, right? 70 weeks, 457 BC, you count 490 years or 70 weeks a day for a year, it brings you down to the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And I want you to notice something here. Because at the end of the 70 week prophecy, the disciples experience what we might call a great disappointment. What did they experience, everyone? Say it with me. A great what? Disappointment. I want you to check this out. Number one, the disciples experience a great disappointment. Number two, why did they experience that disappointment? Because they had the timing of the prophecy right, but the event wrong. In other words, they knew something was going to happen at the end of the 70 weeks, but they thought that Jesus was coming to set his kingdom up on earth. That's what they thought. So they had the, 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 the time right, but the event wrong. In reality, Christ had moved from this earth to the heavenly sanctuary. If you're with me, just let me just see you say, yeah, I'm following you. Okay? Yes, I'm following. Give me a thumbs up. Give me something. So, in reality, Christ had moved from earth to the heavenly sanctuary. And now watch this. Their great disappointment turned into the central point of their growing movement. In other words, instead of going like, oh, we were wrong. Jesus has been resurrected. Uh, uh, you know, Jesus died and we were mistaken. No, 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 no. They, they, they didn't try to hide that mistake. They actually were like, whoa, the very thing that we thought, the one that we thought was the Messiah has passed, is dead. They take that central thought. It becomes the centerpiece of their message, which is, no, he is not dead. He is risen and he's ascended to the right hand of God. And beloved, listen to me. They were mocked for saying that. Oh, yeah, that's, that's really face-saving, man. So... You got the prophecy wrong, and now you're going to say, oh, he's in heaven. Okay, right. Beloved, listen to me. To this day, those that reject that truth are rejecting the plan of salvation, while those who accept that truth are accepting the plan of salvation. It's really that simple. All right. I want you to mark, remember what happened at the end of the 70 week prophecy. We're going to come back to that. So let's keep moving. We're moving along in our movie and I want you to catch this now because what happens is Satan is pulling his hair out. Why? Because all these temples are popping up. What do you mean temples, pastor? I mean house fires. Yes. House after house after house, Bible studies are going on and people are hearing the truth unadulterated and then the people themselves are, when they give their lives to Christ, they are becoming temples. And remember, what was a sanctuary? It was a picture of who God is. So now you have all these little pictures of who God is running around because you know what? They are now exercising self-sacrificing love and they're living pure lives and they're living following the word of God and they're living lives of prayer and they're letting their light shine and they are keeping God's commandments and they are extending mercy to those who oppose them and Satan hates this because now instead of having one temple in the Old Testament that was stationary and did not move as David built now you've got thousands of temples Thousands of temples, not only in individuals, but in homes as the gospel is spreading like wildfire. So Satan has to try to find a way to stop these house fires and to stop these human temples from spreading the gospel. And so what happens is during the Roman Empire, they begin persecuting Christians. But there's a problem because every temple that they break down, every temple that they destroy, five more pop up in their place. They can't seem to beat, Satan cannot seem to beat the Christian church. And so he does something that is mind-blowing that some of you will not even believe. I'll tell you right now. Some of you may be following this presentation and going, man, this is really neat. This is really, whoa, I'm never, what you're about to hear is so almost unbelievable that you're going to be like, nah, 
but I'm telling you, go research it for you. This is not some conspiracy theory. No, 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 no. This is Bible. This is Bible. This is history. History for everyone to see. All right. Pastor, what are you talking about, beloved? This is where, if we're watching a movie, this is where you sit up. All, everything before, that was neat. That was great. Amen. Wow. Well, this is where you need to sit up because this is where you're about to be challenged. Challenged for good, beloved. Because listen, if you love God, the most important thing to you is truth. It is truth. It's not your experience. It's not what you feel. It's truth. And if you want, I, I think you're watching this right now because you're after truth. At least you're open to truth. So I want you to check this out, guys. You need to see this. This is scene number four. We've just completed scene number three, and I want you to check this out because there was another time prophecy given in the book of Daniel, and it is called the 1260 uh, day time prophecy. And I want you to check this out. The Bible says here, well, first of all, let me just give you a little bit of background about the book, about um, this 1260 year prophecy, because it is in the context of Daniel chapter seven. So I'm going to give you a very quick run through of Daniel seven. All right. I want you to see the big picture. Don't focus on the little minute details. We're, we're scanning the big picture of the story of the Bible. All right. So check it out. In the book of Daniel, Daniel sees four beasts. Four beasts. They are described as a lion, a bear, a leopard, and a dragon with ten horns. Now, scholars almost unanimously agree with the Bible that these four beasts represent four kingdoms. The first kingdom was the Babylonian kingdom. That's the kingdom that overthrew or that captured uh, Jerusalem, destroyed Jerusalem, and took the Jews captive. Okay? The second beast, the bear, would represent the nation that overthrew the lion. That would be the Medo-Persian Empire. They rule from around 538 to 331 BC. The third beast would be the kingdom of Greece. Greece is a kingdom that overthrew the Medo-Persian Empire. This is all history, guys. Greece overthrew Medo-Persia. And then the fourth kingdom would be the Roman Empire. Right? This is the fourth beast, the dragon-like beast with great iron teeth and having ten horns. Now, this is the Roman Empire. Rome, the Roman Empire fell in around 476 AD. But I need you to check this out because out of this Roman Empire, the Bible says ten horns would arise. These horns would represent ten kingdoms coming out of Rome. And if you study the history of Rome, you'll know that Rome was not overthrown by any other nation. It fell from within and divided into various kingdoms, which are now today the European nations. But we're talking about four set around 476 AD. Now I want you to watch this because after these 10 horns, there arises another power called a little horn. And I need to tell you about this little horn very quickly. So this little horn is described as an anti-Christian power. Hold your thought here. Because I'm going to show you something amazing. The Babylonian Empire, guess what they did? They destroyed the sanctuary. Remember that? They went over to Jerusalem, destroyed the sanctuary. So the Babylonian Empire attacked the sanctuary. By the way, not only did they destroy the sanctuary... But when they brought the Jews to, uh, to Babylon, they, they set up a command. Remember this? Where they set up an image and commanded it all, bow down and worship the image. That's a direct violation of the law of God. In a sense, we might say that Babylon attacked the law of God. You catch that? All right. Medo-Persia. Medo-Persia, in the time of Daniel, remember this? They passed a decree that no one could pray. To what article of furniture are we talking about when we talk about prayer? The altar of incense found in the holy place. So we might say that Medo-Persia attacked the altar of incense during its reign. When Greece comes on the scene, if you know anything about history, Greece tried to defile the temple of God, labor, defile the temple of God when they offered up a pig in the temple. When we come down to the Roman Empire, you remember that was the empire. See it there on the screen. That was the empire that put Jesus to death 
on the altar of sacrifice, the cross. Each of these four kingdoms attacked the sanctuary. So watch this, guys. If the little horn comes after the Roman Empire, what is it going to do? It also is going to attack the sanctuary. But if the earthly sanctuary is no more in operation, then the question is, what sanctuary would it attack? You got it, guys. Three things you should be saying right now. The heavenly sanctuary, the truth spreading among, among on, the truth spreading on planet Earth, and the human sanctuary. All right, please keep that in mind. And I want you to see this. The Bible says of this little horn, I considered the horns, the ten horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, this horn, in this horn were the eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. Now, I want you to catch something very, very important here. This little horn is described as uprooting three of the ten horns that came out of Rome. There is a power that actually did this, historically speaking. We're coming to that in a moment. This is going to be around 300, 400 AD, okay? So we're thinking now, think with me, this is uh, uh, in the second, uh, third, fourth century. That's what we're looking at right now. The Bible also says of this little horn power in Daniel 7, 25, he shall speak great words against the Most High. Huh, that's interesting. Do you remember in, in, in part one how we learned that Satan also spoke blasphemous words against the Most High? You remember that, right? It says he shall wear out or persecute the saints of the Most High. Did Satan do that in heaven, yes or no? Yes, yes. The Bible also says of this little horn, he shall think to change times and laws. Did Satan think to change God's times and laws in heaven, yes or no? Absolutely, beloved. What I want you to see here is that what this little horn does on earth is the same thing Lucifer did in heaven. He, watch, watch, watch. Look at what the Bible says. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, speaking of the same power, it says, who opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. I got a question for you. Did Lucifer in heaven try to sit in the place of God? Yes, yes he did. Yes he did. Listen guys, very simply, remember this? In heaven, how many angels did Lucifer uproot? One third. How many of the ten horns does the little horn uproot? Three out of ten. That's roughly how much, guys? One third. Did Satan want to change times in heaven and laws? Yes, he did. Does the little horn try to do the same thing on earth? Yes, he does. Does Satan war against the saints in heaven, the angels in heaven? Yes, he did. Does the little horn try to do the same thing on earth? Yes, he does. Does Satan try to claim the place of God in heaven? Yes, he did. Does the little horn seek to do the same thing on earth? Yes, he does. What I'm trying to tell you, beloved, is that this little horn, whoever it is, is basically mimicking the movements of Satan in heaven, and he's doing it, listen carefully, under a disguise of righteousness, just like Lucifer did in heaven. All right, come on, do it. Wait. Put on your seatbelts, guys, because this is about to get real. Listen carefully. I'm about to show you how Satan in the third and fourth end, uh, centuries infiltrated the Christian church, inf infiltrated Christianity to begin to work from the inside. I know, you're like, no way, Pastor. All right, check this out. In 313 AD, by the way, it was, it was Christianity that rose out of the Roman Empire. That is the only power that rose out of the Roman Empire that actually uprooted three of the ten kingdoms that came out of Rome. That, that, that rose out of Rome. I need you to listen to this carefully, guys. In 313, Constantine, 
makes Christianity the state religion, Christianity becomes subject, or I should say Rome, Christianity becomes the state religion of Rome. Now, why is this important to understand? I just need you to catch this, guys. Because you see, when Christianity accepted Constantine, you know what they were doing? When they accepted the protection of Constantine, because Constantine converted, supposedly became a Christian, what ends up happening is the Christian church, in essence, rejected their high priest, Jesus Christ, to put their trust in an emperor named Constantine. Do you remember the mistakes that ancient Israel made? Two of them. Number one was they rejected their priest Samuel for a king, Saul. The, new, the, the, the early church in the third and fourth century AD do the very same thing. They begin to put their trust in man, in an emperor, over their high priest, Jesus Christ. You see, Constantine wanted to mingle paganism with Christianity, and this is, in essence, what begins to happen in the church. Now, that was one mistake. Guess what else Constantine did? Constantine issued an order to build the first basilica. <laughs> oh, man. Wait a minute, guys. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Watch this. In the early church, how did the gospel spread? It was spreading from house to house. There was no central place of, of worship because that was destroyed, right? So, so they're, 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 they're taking the gospel from house to house. That's where the churches are, houses all across the land, houses, 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 the gospel spreading fast. But what does Satan want to do? He wants to stop these houses from, from, from having the truth, from receiving the truth, from having people take the truth to these houses. So he says, hey, here's what we're going to do. We're going to build a big edifice. Something that's beautiful. We're going to draw all the people to us and now we're going to be able to control what the people believe and what they hear because we will set up pastors after our liking and priests after our liking and they're going to be teaching certain things which you're about to see in a minute and what begins to happen, beloved, is that these teachings begin to go directly against what the sanctuary teaches. The very same thing that happened in the Old Testament where Israel re uh, uh, rejected their priest for a king and where they put their trust in building a brand edifice and, and started getting into outward form and ceremony it, and thus leading them into Babylonian captivity is the very same thing that happens that Satan attempts to do and pulls off successfully in the third and fourth century. And what is the result? The result is this. Christianity became infiltrated by Satan. If you follow me, just keep following me. Pastor, how? Please explain to me. What are you saying? By the way, I want you to check this out. In 538 AD, th that is when a decree was given by Emperor Justinian that made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire, that made it the official religion of, of, of the Roman Empire. In other words, at this time, the church was officially in charge of, of Rome. 538 AD. Exactly 1,260 years later, in 1798 AD, that power and authority was taken away. Exactly 1,260 years. Remember what the Bible says? A day for a year when it comes to Bible prophecy. So what happened during those 1,260 years where this anti-Christian power penetrated Christianity and started deceiving people and leading them to do things that were anti-sanctuary? Watch, guys. Watch and listen very carefully. Number one. Number one. The altar of sacrifice points us to Christ's sacrifice for us, his one-time sacrifice for us. 
Well, when, when, when Satan penetrated Christianity, he began to introduce new teachings not found in the Bible. One of those teachings would be something that we called penance, where instead of accepting the sacrifice of Christ on our behalf, that there was nothing we could do to earn what he did for us, now Satan began to say, hey, listen, now they began, he began to put this teaching into the church that in order for you to be forgiven, you have to pay money. You want to be forgiven? Pay up. Now, beloved, listen. Remember we said earlier, if the sanctuary is a picture of God and I want to change people's picture of God, all I need to do is attack the articles of furniture in the sanctuary. Let me ask you, if you were living in those days and you were a poor peasant and you're suddenly told that in order for you to be forgiven by God, you have to pay money, how would you feel about God? Come on, guys, tell me, how would you feel? Yeah, it doesn't stop there. Because not only was penance introduced into the church, which was not a biblical teaching, but something else was introduced and it was called infant sprinkling. You see, beloved, the labor teaches that a man must be baptized, must repent and be baptized. But what, what Satan began to introduce into the church was this philosophy that, listen, God burns babies, by the way. God destroys babies. If they're born, they're born with sin. If they die, they're going to hell. Even if they had done no wrong, they, it doesn't matter. So you got to get your baby baptized, but you can't dunk a baby in water. So we're going to sprinkle these infants. And once they're sprinkled, they're good to go. Never mind the fact that they're not old enough to confess or repent. So now people are thinking, wait a minute, God sends babies to hell? Okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have my baby, uh, you know, uh, 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 sprinkled just in case. But man, what kind of a God is this? But I'm going to keep serving him because, you know, that's what they say. Okay, but I'm telling you, I'm not liking the picture of this God. Not only did they attack the altar of sacrifice, the sacrifice of Christ, not only did Satan begin to... to, to, to turn this teaching of baptism, but he also went to the table of showbread and basically said, listen, traditions are more important than the word of God. And by the way, you can't understand the word of God for yourself. You need to come to the basilica. You need to come to the big house of worship for us to explain the word of God to you. And that's how they began to control what the people believed. Instead of the people being able to study for themselves house to house, they began to control what they believe. If you are found with the word of God, with the Bible in these dark ages, so-called, you are burned at the stake. You guys, I hope you're catching this because there's more. Not only did they attack the table of showbread, they attacked the altar of incense. You remember the altar of incense says, come to God and pray, confess your sins to him. You can speak to him. But Satan said, nah, you can't do that. What you have to do is go to what's called a confessional booth, which happens to be a two compartment room divided by a curtain. Come on somebody. With a man sitting in the place of God claiming to have power to do what only God can do, which is forgive men's sins. Satan was introducing these false teachings into the church and leading people away from God. You're too sinful for God to hear you, so you have to pray through priests. Not only did they attack the altar of incense, but they also went on to attack the candlestick. Remember, God said of his church, you are the light of the world. Well, what Satan did was he began using people in the church to attack people in the church. He began using Christians to persecute Christians. You don't believe this way? You're being burned at the stake. You're going to be excommunicated. And so now here you have one group of Christians persecuting Christians who did not believe that you had to pray through priests, who did not believe that you were supposed to sprinkle babies, who did not believe that you had to pay penance. Now you have so-called Christians in the name of Jesus cru cru persecuting other Christians, trying to put their light out. Their form of evangelism, repent or we'll burn you at the stake. Candlestick, candlestick evangelism. But beloved, listen, above all this, this is one of the most, this is one of the most, listen to me. 
they went up into the Ark of the Covenant and just like the prophecy stated, they shall think to change God's laws. Listen carefully, beloved. Satan brought into the church this idea that the Sabbatismos. <laughs> what did Satan hate in heaven? Come on, guys. You remember this. Satan was against the Sabbatismos in heaven. He hated Sabbatismos in heaven. So he wanted to get rid of that. When he brought war to heaven, he broke the state of rest in heaven. What does he try to do on earth? He tries to attack the commandment that says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And what does he do? He says, nope. We're going to get rid of that commandment and we're going to replace it with a commandment that says the first day of the week and you will find nowhere in the Bible where this, where God ever instructed anything to happen on the first day of the week in terms of Sabbath keeping. Beloved, listen to me. Hold on. Wait. I know what you're thinking. But pastor, we're not under the law. Hold on. What was Satan's argument in heaven? We don't need a law. We don't need sabbatismos. We don't need God telling us what to do. Listen very carefully, beloved. There was a law nailed to the cross. That law was what was called the ceremonial law. The reason we don't need to sacrifice animals today is because Christ was sacrificed for us. He fulfilled that law. But beloved, the Ten Commandments stand on a totally different foundation. They are, the found, they are the foundation of God's throne. That is what is found in the Ark of the Covenant. And Satan is trying to lead people to believe that you don't need to keep the law. It doesn't matter what... By the way, listen to me. It doesn't matter what... You just break one of those laws. You just think to yourself, it's all right for me to commit adultery. All right. If you want to believe that, you think it's all right for me to bow down and worship uh, graven images. All right, if you want to believe that, but I'm just telling you, the Bible says, blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life. That's Revelation 22. Check it out for yourself, guys. It's there. The very thing Satan did in heaven, turned against the law of God, is the very thing he's trying to do on earth, and he does it under a disguise of righteousness. Listen, why would God warn against the changing of his law if it wasn't a big deal? So Satan penetrated the church and, uh, and changed every article of furniture to make it teach something opposite from what it stood for. And beloved, what ends up happening is that the entire picture of God has changed. And listen, by the end of that 1260 year period, you had something occur called the French Revolution. What was the French Revolution? It, it was when France had been so fed up with the hypocrisy of Christianity that they rejected Christianity and the Bible altogether. And this is where the rise of atheism takes place. Yes, atheism existed before, but it did not have such, it had a found, it had a launching pad from the French Revolution because of the hypocrisy of the Christian church during the Dark Ages, the so-called Christian church during the Dark Ages. If you want to know why atheists are so powerful today and are in so great numbers, just look at the history of the so-called Christian church and there you have your answer. Are you catching what's happening? Satan was using Christianity to make it look unappealing so that people would say, I don't want anything to do with it. All right, guys, we're going to keep moving. We're going to keep moving. We're going to, we have just one more part of this scene and then we're going to wrap this up. But you need to listen carefully, beloved, because this, this is something, this is going to be huge. This is going to be huge. All right. How long have I been speaking? Someone tell me, because I don't even know. Uh, I'm waiting for you. Hour. Hour and 15. All right, guys, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask you to give me 15 more minutes. Can you do that? 15 more minutes, okay? Remember, the average movie is two hours. We're only, this has only been an hour and 15. All right. Amen. Let's keep going. All right, guys, check this out. Scene four or scene five. Scene five. 
Tomorrow night, we're going to finish up the latter half of scene five and scene six, and we conclude with that. But I'm going to take you through the first half of scene five tonight, and you have to catch this because, beloved, there is one more prophecy in the book of Daniel, and it is called the 2300 day time prophecy. Let me read it to you. In Daniel 8, verse 13 and 14, the Bible says, Then I heard one saint, this is Daniel in vision, and he hears one saint speaking unto another saint, and he heard the saint saying, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said unto me, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Let me, let me rephrase this for you. Because what Daniel is hearing is the angel is basically saying, how long will, this, will Satan be able to do what he's doing in the church? How long is he, going to, is he going to be able to get away with this deception? And the reply comes back, at the end of 2300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. In other words, the things that were, that were uh, uh, distorted during the 1260 year prophecy would be restored at the end of this time period called 2300 days. Now you remember in Bible prophecy, if we're going to be consistent, a day equals a year. So this 2300 days is really 2300 years. But beloved, listen carefully. There is only one time prophecy in the book of Daniel. It is this prophecy right here, the 2300 days. Listen, listen. The 1260 is a part of the 2300. The 2300 is the big prophecy. The 1260 is simply a part of that, pro like a subsection of that prophecy, just as the 70 weeks is a subsection of that prophecy. So let me break it down for you. Because the prophecy has one starting point, and it was in 457 BC. That's the only starting point given in the book of Daniel for any of these prophecies, 457 BC. So notice on the screen, if you, if you count 70 or 70 times 7, you come to the Roman Empire. That's the 70-week prophecy where Jesus was cut off on behalf of us. The 1260 brings you down to the Dark Ages, but if you count 2300 years from 457 BC, you come to the year 1844. What year, everyone? 1844. If this prophecy is correct, then what it's telling us is that by the year 1844, everything that had been distorted in the 1260 year prophecy would be restored by 1844. All right, guys, let's check this out. Beginning with the 13, and this is going to go rapidly, but just put your seatbelts on because this is going to be good, guys. Check this out. In the 1300s, God began to do something amazing. God began to raise up reformers, people who are saying, wait a minute, something's wrong with this picture of Christianity. And he began to raise up different movements that didn't even realize what they were doing, but they were restoring these articles of furniture without even realizing it. Pastor, what do you mean? Well, listen, in the 1300s, John, God raises up a man by the name of John Wycliffe. John Wycliffe, what he does is he translates the Bible, the Word of God, the Table of Showbread, into the language of the people, giving them access once again to the Word of God. Somebody needs to say amen. This is the beginning of what is called the Protestant Reformation. John Wycliffe restores the table of showbread and when people now have the word of God before them, they can begin to read for themselves again and they're like, wait a minute, hold on, what we're seeing in popular Christianity is not matching up with the word of God. Praise God for John Wycliffe who founded the movement called the Lollards in the 1300s. But in the, in the 1400s, God raises up another man by the name of Martin Luther, the founder of the Lutheran movement. 
praise God for the Lutheran movement because what God does here is he uses Martin Luther to restore the truth, listen carefully, that it is not by penance that we are forgiven of our sins, but simply by the sacrifice of Christ. We are justified by faith in his sacrifice. Martin Luther effectively restores the altar of sacrifice. Do you see what's happening here? God is bringing different movements on the scene to restore different articles of truth until the entire truth was to be restored by what year, everyone? 1844. Let's keep going. In the 1500s, God brings a man upon the scene by the name of John Calvin, who is the founder of the Presbyterian movement. John Calvin believes that you don't have to pray through priests. You can have direct access to God yourself. And Calvin effectively restores the altar of incense. You can pray directly to your heavenly father. Somebody needs to say amen. In the 1600s, God brings another man on the scene by the name of John Smith and, and another man, Roger Williams, who become the founders of the Baptist movement. And what John, what John Smith and Roger Williams begin to teach is that you must repent and be baptized. You can't baptize babies because they don't know the difference between right and wrong. They're not old enough to repent. And when you baptize someone, they must go fully under. They must be fully submersed. That is the symbol of death, burial, and resurrection. When you bury someone, you don't sprinkle them with dirt. You cover them in dirt. So likewise, we must be buried in water. That is the correct symbol of baptism. And praise God for the Baptist movement who God used to begin to bring Christianity back to the place where it should be. In the 1700s, 1700s, God raises up another man by the name of John Wesley, who becomes the founder of the Methodist movement. And John Wesley has this belief that, listen, we have to go out there and be evangelists. We have to move from house to house, from place to place, from street corner to street corner. <laughs> Beloved, listen to me. John Wesley began to, re to, to restore the seven branch candlestick, which is about letting your light shine, being a witness and going out and letting the people People know what you believe and why you believe it come what may praise God for the Methodist movement now beloved that's the 1700s what what century are we in we're now at the 1800s and the question is listen carefully the question is what is the last thing to be restored what was changed in the dark ages that is the last thing left to be restored beloved it is the law of God, including that seventh day Sabbath, and God would bring a movement upon the scene just at that time that the Bible calls the remnant. Revelation 14, 12 says it this way, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Beloved, it is the last thing to be restored. And this, beloved, listen carefully. God brought a movement upon the scene. A movement that was made up of Baptists and Methodists and Presbyterians and Catholics and people of every denomination who began to study this prophecy called the 2300 year prophecy and they began to realize, wait a minute, something's supposed to happen in 1844 and here's what they believed, beloved. They believed, <laughs> they believed that in 1844, the cleansing of the sanctuary meant that Jesus was going to come again to the earth and everybody began preaching it. They have the timing right. They had the prophets, the timing right, but guess what they had wrong? Watch this, guys. If, the, if there's only one prophecy in the book of Daniel, and the 70 weeks is the beginning of the 2300 days, what we're gonna see that what happened at the end of the 70 weeks with the disciples is exactly what happened at the end of the 2300 days with the people of God who were from the Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Episcopalian, Catholic churches. When they all came together to, to, to think of this one prophecy and they all came to the same conclusion, Jesus is coming again in 1844. They were right about the time but wrong about the event. You got to see this, guys. They experienced a great disappointment. They had the timing right, but the event wrong. 
They thought Jesus was coming to cleanse the earth and to set up his kingdom on earth. In fact, Jesus was moving into the final phase of his ministry, the part of his phase in which he was about to begin to choose the jurors. Mm. Pastor, what did you just say? Oh, yeah. Jury selection. Remember that? Remember how God is looking for people who are going to be faithful to him, obedient to him, keep the commandments of God, believe in Jesus, or follow the, that, the, the, the principles of the sanctuary? God says, listen, I'm going to select a jury just before my second coming. And this jury is going to be responsible for judging Lucifer. Beloved, it is this movement that arose around the year 1844, a movement made up of Baptists and Methodists and all kinds of different people. It is this movement that began to go forward with a very special message, which we're not going to get into until tomorrow night because that's the closing part. But beloved, I need you to catch this because it is this very movement, this very belief that even to this day, people are mocking just as they mocked the disciples when the disciples said, oh, Jesus is risen and he went to heaven in a heavenly sanctuary the same thing is happening today with God's end time movement and listen beloved God is trying to do something amazing here you see God won't listen oh man Revelation 14 6 and 7 the Bible says I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth to every nation kindred tongue and people saying with a loud voice Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven, the earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Beloved, this is when the message goes forward. This, this message, listen, I'm closing. Five minutes and I'm done. Three minutes and I'm done. In Matthew 24, verse 14, Jesus said these words, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. But you know what happened? Around 300, 400 AD, Satan penetrated the church and began to twist the gospel and make God, give God a bad name, make God look bad. Yeah, God demands money from you if you want to have your sins forgiven. This gospel was changed during the 1260 years. But it was not until the end of the 2300 years that the gospel was fully restored. And now it is this gospel, the one that was restored at the end of the 2300 days, when this gospel goes forward, then shall the end come. And I got to tell you something, beloved. I don't think it's coincidence that we are all on lockdown right now in our houses. <laughs> uh. Coronavirus somebody. I'm not praising coronavirus. Trust me. I hate coronavirus, but I'm just saying I don't believe it's coincidence Because churches have become so comfortable meeting in their buildings and we're not we're not doing what we should do beloved I believe that 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 in a certain sense This message is now going into homes in a way that it could not have before house fires I hope you're with me God is doing something special here, beloved. You're not watching this by coincidence. This is not by chance. God is inviting everyone to become a part of this end time movement, beloved. And listen, I, there's more to cover, but I need you to catch this because we are all in this together. Satan is out to deceive everybody that he possibly can. I'm not putting any evil motives on any individuals, all right? We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness and high places. And Satan has a lot, a lot, a lot of well-meaning people deceived you can be nice and deceived so beloved we're all in this thing together and I'm preaching I'm preaching my heart out to you right now because I don't care what you are whether you're this denomination or that denomination. I'm trying to preach truth to you right now and hope and pray that you will you will let those barriers fall and just hear the word the word of God and say man is this true or not because if it's true I got to follow it no matter what do you want to be a part of the remnant 
of God, according to Revelation 14, 12, that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Beloved, that's, all, that's my whole appeal to you right now. Yes, I want to be a part of that end time movement. I want to be a part of that people who follow God, wherever, who follow the Lamb with us so ever he goes. That's my appeal, beloved. And I pray that you would make that decision tonight. We're going to push pause. You know what I hate about good movies? When people push pause. But we're going to do that right now. We're going to push pause, and we're going to pick up right here tomorrow night, 5.30. I encourage you again, invite your friends, invite your neighbors. This, stuff, this is being recorded. If they're not able to watch it, you will be able to show them this three-part series later. So do not worry about it. But beloved, as we close, I plead with you, if you've not made a decision to follow the Lamb with a survey goals, I'm inviting you to do so now. I'm inviting you to make that decision now because I truly believe that time is short. Nobody knows the day or the hour, but time is short. We are living in really, really strange times. I want you to listen to the song. At the end of it, I will come back and pray, and may God bless you.